Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of The Good Lieutenant. And I'm Vivi Ganeshanathan, also known as Sugi, author of the novel Love Marriage. So with the 2020 census results are finally out. Have you had a chance to study them? I sit around all the time dying for census data. Um, but, you know, it's, is this like an assignment that I had? Do I have to do it? Did I have to do it this week in particular? Did you do your assignment or did you not? <laughs> I'm, not I'm going to no comment that like my son usually does when I ask him about his own work. Well, uh, if you had done your assignment, if you had studied the census results, you would be aware that the U.S. has become more diverse and is expected to continue the trend, uh, which is consistent with earlier predictions. And that that's true, not just in urban areas, but in rural areas also. Did you know that, Whitney? I know that from looking out the window in my neighborhood, which is much more diverse. And, and it's a neighborhood that I grew up in. You know, I mean, you can see those changes, I think, everywhere in America. Um, there are some issues, though, even with the, even even with the census delivering that extremely interesting information that is also can be verified by looking out your window. I, the Black and Hispanic populations were undercounted. It, it turns out, right? So, and once again, the non-Hispanic white population was overcounted. So I'm shocked. Yeah. I'm shocked. Tune into the virtual book channel for my shocked face if you are an audio listener only. Uh, so even rural areas could potentially be more diverse than is shown in the 2020 census. And I bet conservative politicians would be celebrating right about now, but the Census Bureau noticed the discrepancy and assigned recounts. I like the Census Bureau. They seem, I just, it's a really important thing that we do. And every year I'm really excited about it. And I was really nervous, you know, that the Trump was going to screw the census up somehow. But he really it seems wanted like to. He was trying so hard. He tried so hard. He tried to blow up the post office, tried, you know, but anyway. I just, I just love that. One of the things that I think is important about America is that we, we have decent data and they're not friendly to the voter suppressing right. It's, um, it's very exciting that we're now, this conversation makes us the number one nerdiest podcast. Um, but this topic does have me wondering if the country is becoming more diverse, even more diverse than the 2020 census originally depicted. I'm kind of curious about what this data predicts about the future of fiction and specifically fiction in and of and from rural places. Definitely. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We want to talk about what rural fiction might look like in the year 2050, 30 years from now, or, you know, 29. Later in the episode, we'll talk to poet Damaris B. Hill. But first, we're going to talk to Julia Elliott. Julia's writing has appeared in Tin House, The Georgia Review, Conjunctions, The New York Times, Granta Online, and other publications. She's the winner of a Rona Jaffe Writers Award, and her stories have been anthologized in the Pushcart Prize, Best of the Small Presses, and Best American Short Stories. Her debut story collection, The Wilds, was chosen by Kirkus, BuzzFeed, Book Riot, and Electric Literature as one of the best books of 2014, it was also a New York Times book review editor's choice. Her first novel, The New and Improved Ronnie Futch, was published in October 2015. She teaches English and women and gender studies at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, where she lives with her daughter and husband. Julia, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. How are things in South Carolina? Um, well, today, it finally, we had our cold, much long awaited cold snap to yeah. like cl clear away the like stagnant, disgusting, <laughs> humid weather. Uh, in our show today, we're going to be talking about the most recent sense, taking the most recent census as our cue to imagine what rural fiction might look like 30 years from now in 2050, when who knows what the weather will be like in South Carolina. Um, your yes. stories are set almost exclusively in rural South Carolina. They often take place somewhere outside the small city of Aiken or reference places like Lake Marion or Fox Creek High School. Some descriptions might lead readers who know South Carolina, and I am not one of them, uh, to the conclusion that the setting of a given story is the Midlands, where others are clearly indicate low country. How did growing up in South Carolina influence your fiction? Okay, well, I would like to say that in my first collection, definitely over half of the stories take place in South Carolina, but there are some other wild ones that are just in like weird places um, that are not even in the South. Um, and then the novels in South Carolina too. Um, and then my last round of stories, which are not yes, yet published in book form, but have been published in various journals. A lot of those that don't take place in the South. 
Um, I have had two stories in Best American Short Stories, and one of them, Hellion, we'll talk about today, is a very South Carolina story. But then the other story, Bride, takes place in a medieval monastery, not monastery, sorry, convent, and it's basically a magic realist uh, story that takes place in a medieval convent, so very different from the Southern stories. Um, but nevertheless, I'm definitely influenced by the culture of the South that I grew up in. Um, my parents were both from the low country of, the South, of South Carolina, and my father was an elementary school principal who moved us around a bit. And so I've lived in like three different small towns from different parts of the state. Uh, the low country, Aiken, South Carolina, Hampton, South Carolina, the low country, um, where a, some high profile murders have just happened. You might want to edit that out. Um, and then Aiken, South Carolina. And then um, there's also uh, 96 South Carolina, which is a little bit in the upper part of the state. I guess. And then there's also Columbia, South Carolina, the Midlands where I live now. Um, and so I'm definitely influenced by the culture. I feel that I will always have what I call an inner hick inside of me that I will never get rid of. Um, and I'm very influenced by the ecology of the South, the oppressively humid but rich low country weather, for example, the shrieking insects, the cicadas, the Spanish moss, the swampy terrain, I even joke that maybe like the swamps are full of these weird endemic brain parasites and I've been infected with one and it's given me what my father used to call a hyperbolic condition so that I always exaggerate. <laughs> um, but at the same time, when I was growing up, I was always an outsider and a weirdo. Like I never belonged in any of these tiny towns. And my dad was kind of a weirdo himself. He has like half of a PhD basically and then he became a principal. He wanted to be an academic but he had four kids, so he had to like get a job. So he became a principal. And um, he like encouraged me to read Dostoevsky in middle school. I don't know if that was good for me or not. Um, but I always like kind of approached life from an outsider's perspective. And I was also kind of strange looking. I was like really pale and freckly and red haired. And all the Southern people like really emphasized getting a tan and spending your entire day like beside bodies of water, like tanning yourselves with weird concoctions like Coca-Cola and baby oil. And so like, uh, if I did try to do that, but I would be like, you know, hellishly burned. Um, and so I didn't fit in with that like side either. So like physically was kind of <laughs> considered freakish and strange. Um, and so I guess like my outsider status as an observer definitely like influences the way that I look at um, these communities through my fiction. So interesting, like you have a Southern aesthetic, but it's your, it's your own aesthetic and not perhaps the predominant one. And so your work also blends genres and subverts in really interesting ways, reader expectations of what I think, you know, rural fiction is and can be. The New York Times review of the new and improved Ronnie Futch calls you uh, Flannery O'Connor for the data mining age, such a great phrase. And another review describes your novel as Flowers for Algernon as imagined by George Saunders. And there is no doubt that the narrator of the novel sounds postmodern despite his, uh, and heavy air quotes here, redneck qualities. What inspired you to write in the voice of a postmodernist? Well, I've always kind of struggled between like my academic self and what I call my inner hick. So I was born in a small town. I lived in small towns, but I also went through an MFA program and a PhD program. I am a professor in an academic like environment who uses all the critical theory jargon and I use it in my classes. Um, and so I wonder what would it be like if you, how, how could you have like a rural person that was somehow equipped with this analytical apparatus. Like, what, how would they see the world if suddenly their mind was expanded? And then I became obsessed with like brain downloads because maybe around like say 2008, a lot of, uh, I, I was actually teaching a dystopian lit class at the University of South Carolina. And every day I would bring my students three factoids and one would be uh, fake and two would be real. And I would, be searching for like futuristic sounding tidbits that were real. And there was a lot of stuff out there about brain downloads. And so it made me think what would happen if like one of these people that I grew up with suddenly was equipped with like the equivalent of a humanities PhD within a month, like how would their view toward the world change? So I feel like in some way Romy Futch like helped me, helped me 
sort of meld these conflicting aspects of my uh, myself because I am still a small town person who was terrified my first few days of graduate school at Penn State University where I got my MFA. I remember going to a critical theory or literary theory class and just thinking that they were speaking gibberish and I would never be able to understand what they were even saying. But then eventually I get sort of initiated into the world of academia um, and I feel alienated from both worlds. But somehow Romy Futch gave me this language that I could like, with which I could access kind of both from these weird vantage points. And, um, and I feel like that that hybrid voice enabled me to grapple with the complexities of like contemporary, what you might call postmodern Southern existence, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't kept up. Barry Hanna is dead. I haven't kept up on Barry yeah. Hanna as like a reputation as a person, but I do know his work. Um, and and I, ha I always think back to him as being somebody who's, who did this at an early time. You know, Airships is a really interesting yeah. Story collection. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I am. I've read most of uh, his work um, and was influenced by it, like at, at a certain period. Like there are some Southern writers that I haven't read. Like I, I have only read a few Faulkner things and people are like, what? You know, how, how could you? Um, and I don't really love Flannery O'Connor, but I like you do our wealthy a lot. And uh, um, Carson McCullers would be like my favorite kind of classic Southern writer. But I do remember Airships like has like just a straight up weird dystopian story about roving bands of kind of post-apocalyptic people or something. Yeah, I had to, I went to my called. bookshelf and somebody yeah. took my Airships book. It made me so mad when I was preparing for this. Yeah, I, I should go grab mine. Uh, but so, then he can write a, a perfectly like he writes these nostalgic stories that are also based on his weird college days that have nothing to do with like genre, you know, like Geronimo Rex is like that, but eating wife yeah. and friends is the story from airships and another one called escape to Newark that were sort of futuristic post-apocalyptic right, stories yeah. that he was writing. Um, anyway, I just wanted to mention him because I think that yeah. there's, there's strains of him that is are in George Saunders and, you know, people, yeah. it's interesting to see connections between work like that. Um, so on the note of genre bending, your, your, your fiction has been labeled magical, dystopian, Southern Gothic with spin, strange, realism, fantasy. I'm using these are all quotes put together. Satire, futuristic, technological, dark, hilarious, and endangered species. I, I have another friend who writes about life in rural Missouri, uh, Daniel Woodrell, who really, he's been called like country noir, and he really dislikes, oh, okay. he really dislikes yeah, labels, right? And yeah. so how do you relate to the label of being a Southern writer or these other labels that people try to put on you to sort of, we, I noticed earlier in, the, in your talk, you were like, well, I don't only write about South Carolina. I mean, are you worried about being a Southern yeah, writer? Well, I mean, I feel writer? like it's easier for them to market people with, with that kind of regionalism, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I don't mind as long as like I can get published. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I always have genre bending associated with it. So it's not considered straight up Southern Gothic or anything like that. Um, I feel like these days the the sort of boundaries between like so-called literary fiction and genre fiction have definitely collapsed. And a lot of writers are just moving here and there to tell stories in whatever way they can to best capture what they're trying to convey. Um, and so I see genres as tools that I can use um, and combine to tell whatever I need to tell, and especially to describe complicated realities um, of today's world. Um, even if I am writing about the South, rural or not. Um, and Southern people even who live in the, the hinterlands of like the South and these uh, seemingly disconnected places, they're all like on the internet and they also may find it hard to distinguish between science and science fiction and conspiracy and reality. And their very realities are sort of blurred the same way, you know, people blur genre boundaries. Um, also, whenever I went to grad school, I wasn't really immersed in Southern fiction at all. I went to Penn State and my favorite professor was an experimental writer named Paul West. And I was like reading Franz Kafka and Angela Carter. And so it was like, oh, here's a new breed of surrealism. Here is fairy tale retellings. You can do that. Amazing. And then I uh, was reading like um, magic realism for the first time. And like writers like Leonore Carrington, like a pretty hardcore surrealist. And then a little bit later, George Saunders completely blew my mind. And uh, because of the way that he 
use dystopian tropes with a kind of colloquial voice. Um, and so I realized, you know, I was just really attracted to people who, to more experimental or innovative approaches. I mean, we've picked you for this episode or our, my student, uh, Hayden Baker, who picked you for this episode, because this is his idea. Um, and it's a great idea, you know, because in fact, we, you know, we think that we, I think, I think he thinks that that experimental and sort of moving between genres is what rural fiction is moving toward. Yeah, um, I think. instead I mean, of you know, really. writing about, you know, being a farmer or whatever, do you agree? But we should ask you rather than saying that we think that that's what it is. You know? Well, if you're writing about being a farmer, it would definitely be a new kind of farmer. Because on the one hand, you have like the so-called old school farmers who have highly industrial approaches. Like I have relatives who, you know, they use, they, they plant Roundup ready corn and drench their fields and toxins and then like that, that sort of thing. But then you also have like jaded city people moving to rural areas and starting organic farms, including my husband. So like we have land in Swansea, South Carolina, which is about 40 minutes away from Columbia. And um, it's ex incredibly rural and he's doing like organic farming out there. And then of course we have fantasies about like building a cabin and spending more time there. And so just like all of those people who like fled New York City during the pandemic and move to upstate New York with some kind of fantasies of the rustic idyllic life. <laughs> Although we did this long before the pandemic. Um, and so in that way, like things change as well. Um, so I do feel like uh, that more and more, of course, Southern writers or rural people, usually when they're writing, they have uh, gotten a lot of distance from their upbringing. And they've usually been exposed to like academic communities and different social circles. And so they kind of go back to their rural upbringings with a different perspective. And so um, having to write like a straight up rural story in the vein of like, I don't know, um, well, I, none of the writers that I can think of really write straight up rural stories, but you know, just just the, 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 the rule of realism I feel like is, is fading and people feel like that they can draw upon different genre tropes to tell more complicated stories about um, rural places. Julia, I wonder if you could read us a section from your book. Okay, did you want me to provide a little context first, right? So um, this is from the new and improved Romy Futch. And after Romy Futch, who was down on his luck, he's basically a down on his luck taxidermist. Um, he participates in an intelligence enhancement study at a research um, center in Atlanta called the Center for Cybernetic Neuroscience. And he basically has a PhD's worth of humanities lore downloaded into his brain. And so he goes back to his hometown with all of this intellectual baggage and attempts to save his failed marriage and revolutionize his taxidermy dioramas into like postmodern masterpieces. Um, so the section that I'm gonna read you happens after he's returned and he becomes obsessed with bagging this perhaps a uh, biotech mutant hog that is ravaging the landscape and all these hunters are obsessed with it. So I'm going to read a little section about hog hunting in the dystopian South. Okay. I stayed up all night Googling feral hogs, whereas domesticated swine were sweet Wilbur's bred for docility. All it took was a few weeks in the wild to transform these corn-fed fatsoes into snorting murderous monsters. Their regression to wild beast was almost instantaneous. Bristly black hair burst from their tender skins. Razor sharp tusks shot from their foaming jaws. Add to this a high IQ and an all consuming food obsession and you've got a wily fiend ready to rip up whatever landscape it happens to rage through, ready to tear its cutters into whatever warm body it stumbles upon nostrils on high alert for the scent of estrus sal. All across the south, these porcine demons were raising hell. Thousand pound monster tusker bag near Cartusa, Georgia, read one headline. Pigfoot downed in Asheboro, North Carolina, said another. In Texas, the feral hog population was off the chart, well into the range of epidemic. In an article titled, Texas Succumbs to Pig Plague, wax poetic while slyly alluding to a Guns N' Roses LP. 
Feral hogs spawn like rabbits, producing up to two liters, litters per year. Uh, droves of fierce tushers not only tear up farmland, but also trot boldly through suburbs in groups more than 20 strong. They snuffle through trash, root up sprinkler systems, devour all small animals in their path. Their appetite for destruction is bottomless. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department had declared open season, going so far as to legalize helicopter hunting, allowing gung-ho Rambos to take out swine from the air. There were documented cases of people being bitten, a handful of dismemberments, a few deaths, nine-year-old boy in Roxy, Mississippi, torn apart by Razorback, proclaimed one paper. According to the article, the boy's bones were picked clean by a frenzied group of sows. The mullet wrapper described the brutal end of a hunter in the Everglades who was pounded to pulp by a herd of apocalyptic porkers. The feral hog population in South Carolina, somewhere around 200,000, was just beginning to become a nuisance. According to the Clemson Extension, which had started conducting hog management workshops, the worldwide swine menace must be nipped in the bud. In addition to declaring open season with no bag limit, the Department of Natural Resources now sponsored special hog hunts twice a year. I discovered that my old rival, Baines Potworth, had cornered the market on trophy boarheads, featuring a tusked monster with a mouthful of fake foam on his taxidermy website. And all this time I'd been oblivious, puttering in a dream of self-obsession and heartbreak. I hadn't updated my website in four years, but no more. Adrenaline gushed through my veins. I sat at my desk, clutching my grandfather's old savage rifle, surfing the hinterlands of the internet, my bloodshot eyes glimmering like Ahab's when he scanned the sea for a telltale spume. At last, I stumbled upon the message board of wildhog.com, a regional pig hunting website where full-fledged Hogzilla obsession had broken out Hiding behind monikers like pig man and bored to death, hunters voiced their mania. They spread half-truths and trafficked in myth-mongering. They dropped helpful tips and red herrings. Many of them posted in the wee hours a dead giveaway of their obsessive tendencies. I could see them dressed in muddy camo, hunched over their computer screens. I could hear the click of their calloused fingers on plastic keys, could smell their whiskey breath, their unwashed hair, the hog attracting scents they wore like rare perfumes, swine wine, apple delight, feral fire, sow in heat spray. Though, the, though they caught glimpses of the legendary pig all over the county, Hogzilla always managed to elude them just when they crept near, disappearing into brush, melting into mist, leaping into oblivion with a waft of ruttish scent. The creature taunted them with its massive glistening turds encrusted with seeds and bones, left tracks deep enough to, for birds to bathe in. Hogzilla's wallows, those muddy spots where the swine was fond of floundering, always seemed to brim with fresh spicy piss and steaming stools, though the hog himself was almost never in sight. I think that's where you wanted me to stop. Thank you so much. Um... I think that passage is such a great example of how your work has reinvented rural fiction. You've said previously, and I'm, I'm quoting here from an interview you did with Tin House. I love this quote so much. In the past, Southern writers have been fetishized as holy fools, semi-feral backwoods prophets that give voyeurs a glimpse of the wilderness below the Mason-Dixon line. Even today, readers sometimes forget that Southern writers inhabit the same technologically complex world they do. Your fiction often explores this intersection between technology and rural places, sometimes to the point of futurism. So I'm really curious, you know, what you think rural fiction will look like 30 years from now, given the role that technology plays in some of your work. Yeah, I mean, I feel like both the rural places themselves have changed and rural writers like are like on to uh, genre bending and experimental prose and they no longer feel confined uh, to be, you know, Southern Gothic writers or uh, Appalachian noir writers or whatever. So, you know, rural writers are usually people who have left their town and become another person, um, influenced by academic institutions and other social environments. And they often read wild, widely 
and have access to the same writing that any other writers do, like hardcore science fiction writers or um, you know, horror writers or whatever. Um, and so they realize that they can use these tropes to tell um, complex, the complex stories that they need to tell. Um, so I feel like there will be less pressure to play the backwoods prophet, to pretend like they themselves are of the land, you know, um, that they're, you know, more complex than that. Um, and then I feel like the rural places themselves um, will change as well. Like um, some rural places are edged out by industrial spaces becoming more like blatantly dystopian. Others are edged out by exurbia. And then again, I, as I already mentioned, like college educated people are fleeing cities and moving back uh, to rural places where land is cheap and taxes are low to experiment with like organic farming and things like that. Um, and then of course you also have like demographic changes with like, uh, you know, ethnicity uh, changing these places as well. And so the, the rural places themselves become more complex and it's harder to sort of uh, capture these complexities with like straight up kind of realistic fiction, I feel. Although I do feel that realistic fiction can still do that. But a lot of it even like taps into genres like crime fiction or, you know, like there's a genre called Appalachian noir that definitely is not exactly realism so um and so i feel like they will probably become uh more open to experimenting with genre but not necessarily bound to that um and i feel like writers are capable now of like you can write a realistic story one day if you feel like it and then if you feel like writing a horror story or telling a, a story about like a rural place through the horror genre or something you can do that too um and because these like uh, the binary of like serious literary fiction and genre fiction has been deeply challenged for the past 20 years, then I feel like most writers are aware of that and take advantage of that. And we're gonna to talk to Damaris Hill in the next part of this episode about sort of those demographic changes in the South. And I do think that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. I was just thinking of a book called the meat racket that uh, a guy from Kansas City published that's about um, Tyson Foods and how immigrants from other countries are like run their chicken farms because nobody in, who's in America knows that it's just, everyone knows it's a scam, right? And so you have these immigrant populations coming in and being absorbed into this like factory farming situation, right? And changing the demographic nature of the towns that they're in. Things like that that have, that have to do with capitalism, really, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The other thing I was thinking about, A, is also humor, I think, is like going to be the is more dominant form than like the sort of high seriousness of William Faulkner, for instance, who we mentioned earlier. But Faulkner could be funny, but that wasn't his main you know, way of writing. And also uh, climate change. Yeah, definitely climate change. <laughs> um, well, the South is already like a sweltering hellhole. So when you add climate change into the mix, who knows what will happen? Although this year has been weirdly temperate. Uh, for Columbia, you know, like, I, I mean, expected, uh, I think rural places around Kansas City, where I live, or where and around Minneapolis, where Sugi lives, are going to become weirdly popular as, yeah. like, you know, urban centers on the coast, where there's going to be serious sea level change, are going to have a lot of destruction. And I think they'll, I think it's going to change population patterns. I think more people will live where I live. I don't yeah. know about the South because it's going to be hot down there. Maybe. <laughs> My friend who lives in New York City every day over the summer, he checked the weather and more days than not, it was more hot and humid in New York City than in Columbia, South Carolina. Interesting. But that doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. And I've looked at those weird maps that like forecast like the hell that's in store. So, uh, yeah. So, Julia, you've previously referred to your 2014 short story collection, The Wilds, as a feminist collection. In fact, almost all of those stories feature women as protagonists. And I could be wrong, but it seems like we've been seeing more women as main characters in rural fiction in the last decade or so. That's just my my anecdotal impression. And usually these women are tough and adroit. And I'm thinking, you know, Wits already mentioned uh, Daniel Woodrell's, um, who wrote Winter's Bone. And I think of that as one example. And I, I wonder how you think the depiction of women in rural fiction has changed over time and how you imagine it might continue to evolve. Well, like I said, I have not read a whole lot of rural fiction, believe it or not. <laughs> like I said, I tend to gravitate toward like experimental writing and surrealism 
And I watch a lot of horror movies and teach classes on horror movies. So I'm all over the place. But uh, I feel like uh, rural fiction will probably follow the same arc as fiction has. And the main change there is that you just have more and more women writing about women characters, which means that you're going to have less of a male gaze and more of a three-dimensional uh, character with maybe unexpected traits um, and stereotypes. Uh, um, and so sometimes like male writers might want to write about like a tough and sexy backwoods woman or something, but maybe a female writer would have the toughness there, but they wouldn't like present it through the same lens. I'm not saying all male writers would present it that way, but definitely bringing a female gaze uh, to the writing is, is what will probably um, change it. Um, and then I think there's also a hyper awareness of feminism as a discourse and of stereotypes that you could potentially create. So all writers are constantly thinking about that. Like, oh my God, did I just write a damsel in distress scene? I have to remove that because I'm gonna be you know, criticized for it. And so it's almost like you're, this hyper awareness will lead you to make certain choices as you're writing. And I feel like all writers kind of have that in mind these days. Um, and that would probably influence the way women characters are presented too. Cause like you struggle not to create certain stereotypes. I was, as I was thinking about this question, I was, I've been, I've been watching Westworld, um, like right before I go to bed, which is not mm -hmm. for my own mind, like that intelligent of a decision. And, <laughs> um, the way that kind of, I mean, that is, you know, set in an imaginary West that is, um, like performatively rural, um, yeah. like ruralism is escape. And then the ways that the women protagonists evolve and also comment on the, like there's one moment where one protagonist sort of turns around and someone asks her how she had managed to pull something off. And she says, I imagined I was not the damsel in distress. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, sort of the way that the story begins. Um, I don't know. So it's just, it's one example that I was thinking of. And of course, like that's a dystopian story, like the dystopian yeah. maybe what makes that possible, which is also something that I, I feel like I see in, I mean, in your work and in what you're saying about the ways that maybe genre is expanding some possibilities of ways to do this. Yeah, for sure. And then I feel like just hyper awareness of genre tropes themselves kind of tie into character tropes, like you were saying with Westworld. Like, I mean, your characters are aware of those kinds of tropes, right? Because the narrator a lot of times. In, in the story Hellion, <laughs> uh, which was featured in Best American in 2019, you know, um, she, you know, says to herself, ladies sat still and tormented themselves with stiff dresses and torture chamber shoes. Ladies held their tongues when men walked among them and fixed them food and drinks. Um, that story takes place like 30 years ago. You know, there's mm -hmm. a, an arcade game, the, the arcade game Cubert, which came out in 1982 is mentioned, right? So yeah. you're talking about gender norms at that time. I think that, that if you look at, uh, writers, uh, if you look at, I'm going to use the term writers. I mean, I'm talking like dumbasses on the right who are who are, are think tank people will talk about the the south or rural places as places where traditional american values can yeah. be found right and what they really mean sometimes are like traditional american women inhabiting traditional yeah. american roles and shutting up and doing exactly the things that your your character hellion makes fun of yeah. um so uh, you know in 30 years is that going to be gone or are we still well, going to be mean that battle yeah, I feel like conservatives are maintaining like a fantasy, you know, and then on the other hand, there's their, their lived lives. Um, and so I haven't kept in touch with any of the people that I like lived, grew up with, really, um, unless they like took the same arc that I did. But I do have relatives that still live in rural places. And um, most of my female relatives like went to college and became teachers and moved back to the rural towns. And they uh, are definitely still expected to be mothers. They're essentialized as mothers for sure, but the whole housewife role is kind of perceived as something uh, that upper-class women do. And so middle-class rural people or um, people, uh, uh, working-class rural people definitely perceive like um, the working woman as an ideal because it's like they have to do it to make make it work economically. Um, so you've definitely got that. You've got more women going through college and all of that. But then the, the ideal of the lady who doesn't overstep certain bounds 
uh, is still there. And like the idea that women shouldn't speak too frankly about like politics and that sort of thing, it's considered rude, um, is still there. Although in my family, no one is supposed to speak about politics actually, whether you're male or female. Um, but then like uh, a, a lot of my, my cousins who like they might teach school or something, but they also kind of pride themselves on this toughness of the rural life. Like they know how to shoot a gun, they can grow vegetables, albeit Roundup ready tomatoes or something. Um, and they can ride an ATV, you know, drive one, et cetera. But uh, they definitely have a hostility toward the concept of feminism and LGBTQ culture. They consider both of those to be sort of threats to uh, what they consider to be like normal biologically and godly ordained culture, I would say for sure. So that even though some of them are embodying elements of feminism in their very lives, they would never ever use that label to describe themselves. Are we still going to be doing that shit in 2050? That's what I'm. Oh no, not in 2050. <laughs> oh no, I don't. Let's see, in 2050, <laughs> it's like the cis hetero patriarchy, like totally destroyed by 2050. <laughs> oh gosh, I, I mean, it could be like. Um, I mean, if women continue to educate we've themselves, we've read the Handmaid's Tale. That... Like, imagine a southern version of the Handmaid's Tale. That the other the other before. option, however, I think then, is that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You, you well, the diversity of the culture too, like uh, that when we were talking about earlier how the demographic has changed, a lot of Southerners still think of those people as outsiders and don't realize that they're actually integrated into their society. And there will come a day when the society, the society is so integrated that it will just be so changed that, um, you know, you'll have like a more multicultural Southern um, situation and, uh definitely like in the the far future there may even be no concept of southernness <laughs> there may even be no concept of rural you know because like it's really interesting like little tiny farms could be surrounded by like gigantic industrial chicken houses or meat packing plants or amazon distribution centers you know because a lot of those places are on the outskirts of uh, the place where i live and like there is an Amazon warehouse and like not too far from it are like little farms and things. So the very concept of a rule itself is probably going to change. Yeah. And I think that in terms of these questions of identity that we're talking about, I think you're, you're right to note that, I mean, some of this is about demographic change, but then also some of it is about um, the emergence into a more mainstream gaze of things that have always been there. Yeah, uh, it's true. And then the very hostility with which people cling to these archaic models kind of shows that they're in like crisis mode, you know, because things are changing so fast that they can't deal with it. And so they cling to um, archaic ideas about uh, th things that they might not even enact in their life, but just to sort of make themselves feel better and let more in control in the rapidly changing world. Yeah. The security blanket of thinking that everything is just like you. Traditional, um, yeah. Yeah. We've got to clean. And the traditional value is something that you have to defend at all costs or like some nightmarish culture is going to erupt that, you know. And then conspiracy theory sort of covers all of that. <laughs> and then the way that conspiracy theory has erupted across rural landscapes, like that's really weird too, because that's almost like magic realism or something, right? And they're I feel like it's sort of like more Facebook. outlandish ones. <laughs> Facebook oh, works sure. a little bit like smallpox did. What you know, like it, your mm -hmm. people are totally unvaccinated, and not, and that's an, obviously a metaphor that works now yeah. today against the kind of ways that Facebook can transmit uh, lies, and people just don't are aren't handling yeah. it well. And then a lot of the lies that people believe, like all that QAnon stuff, it's like really fantastical. Some of it sounds like stuff from. Cronenberg movie or like outrageous horror movies from the 70s or something, you know, like the, uh, what is it? The QAnon belief that the say, evil liberal Satanists drink adrenochrome, which is some kind of uh, hormone harvested from tortured children. Does that not sound like something from an insane sort of horror sci-fi novel or something? And actually I think it was Hunter S. Thompson who invented the term adrenochrome, so. Uh, and then you have like rural people believing these outlandish, uh, 
you know, fantasies. They're basically fantasies. So that's really interesting. We did an episode on conspiracy theory a while back, but I don't oh, know. Oh, wow. That, that must have been fun. Uh, Whitney did make me read a lot about QAnon, which I had pretty much purposely avoided before that. He was like, did you know? And I was like, I didn't. I was maybe okay yeah. without knowing it. But yeah, I mean, I think that um, the notion of conspiracy theory and magic realism having like a significant overlap is really is really fascinating. Um, I love the idea too that, um, yeah, I mean, how much do any of these categories, rural and urban, um, you know, the, the notion of white America and um, Americans of color, like all of these borders are porous anyway. Yes. And like the notion of purity um, or like sort of a clear line between any of these things is is false anyway. So it's true. Yeah. I feel like your, your vision of 2050 is, is very appealing to me. But in the meantime, um, we encourage our listeners to go out and pick up a copy of the new and improved Romy Futch uh, published in 2015. And we're looking forward to it. Did you, did you mention that you have a new collection of stories that are maybe coming out? Oh, that- no, unfortunately, uh, they're not coming out anytime soon. But I was just saying that I've a, a lot of them have been published in literary journals. And I would say that the ratio of Southern versus non-Southern is a little uh, different from the wilds. Okay. Well, yeah. we will encourage Not our quite listeners a Southern Gothic. <laughs> to, to go and look for those, uh, to read the wilds and to look for the new and improved Romy Futch. Julia, thank you so much for joining us. We really thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thank you.